Because if we say good enough is not good enough, there's always room to grow. I was in a boy band back in the day, and we had worked with some of the greatest producers, some of the greatest names, and we were supposed to be the next big thing, right? And then something happened, and it hit the wall. And I look back, Mark, and I'm like, I am so glad we didn't blow up as big as they said we would. Just got off stage in Serbia in front of like 35,000 people. It's a very different energy when I'm on stage. I'm like, exit festival, make some noise. And I'm putting this energy out there to get this energy back. As a coach, as someone, as a mentor, I've had the blessing of working with some people that were on the top of the billboard charts. The depth of darkness that they were in, they never wanted anybody to know their struggle. We live in this performance-based society when your weaknesses are your strengths with fear attached to them. Yes. I have a high ambition, but add the fear of if I don't do this right, then I am a loser, I'm not good enough, I'm gonna be isolated, I'm gonna be alone, I'm not gonna survive. Then it becomes perfectionism, now it's your downfall. So on your podcast, Making It Happen, I noticed that uh, there was an episode a while back called Good Enough Is Not Enough. And that caught my eye because I always had this line with my team and I've had this line like, good enough is never enough. I don't want mm -hmm. someone else to just go like, oh, that's good enough. Because if it right. matters to me, it matters to, to my clients and it matters to my team and it matters to my family. Like, like if it matters to me, good enough is never enough. 100%. But on the other side of that, you can feel like this crushing weight of like, oh man, good enough is never enough. I'm just so yeah. tired. <laughs> right, right. What, is, what does good enough mean to you? You know, it's interesting. So to, to I'll give two quick little stories that I think will give context to, to that phrase for me. I had put together this uh, pretty big uh, opening uh, conference for this company out here. And I'm sitting in their parking lot and I heard this, you know, it's the voice. For me, it's God, whatever someone believes in, right? Universe, intuition, whatever you believe. And I, I was sitting there and I heard these words. I, it said, love yourself exactly where you are and also love yourself enough not to stay where you are. So it's not an either or like, oh, I'm not good and I'm not great. So I'm going to keep striving for something else. But it's like, no, I'm going to love the freaking heck out of myself right now and love myself enough not to stay where I'm at. And to me, that's it, it's one of those things where because if we say good enough is not good enough, there's always room to grow. And we're always going to never feel quote unquote enough. But that actual podcast episode that you mentioned really came to me when I was sitting in the hospital when my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And I'm sitting there and it was one of those days where I was there from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. I was there all day and I was just sitting there when she was sleeping and I was staring at her and I said, man, one day that's going to be me, whatever way that is. I'm going to be at the end of my time. And I'm going to say, what am I going to want to say? What am I really going to want to say? And what would I be happy to say? And what would I feel confident to be like, man, that was a, a, an incredible life. I fully gave everything back. And I realized that I was settling with good enough. I wasn't really happy or fully content in certain areas, but it was what was the pattern of my life. And I was like, no, man, I'm going to juice the freaking heck out of this life and it's time, you know? And so that's kind of those two stories combined may give context to that, you know? And that was back, your mom passed in 2016, did she? Yeah, 2016. So this is a number of years now, right? It's 2023. <laughs> Somehow I lost track of the years. I think it's 2023. Yeah. So, so that was a, a good seven years ago. I've read Bonnie Ware's, you know, Five Regrets of the Dying. And I kind of had this moment too, um, where I was like, man, I don't want to be on those last days, on those last breaths and have these regrets. And if yeah. they're common regrets for everyone... Anyone who's lost someone realizes just how fleeting life can be. 100%. I tend to fall in denialism. Like I tend to get, I've learned this now, like I tend to get depressed and I tend to become apathetic and gotcha. I tend to become nihilistic where I'm like, well, what's the point? Like, like if life is so short, what's the point? Right. If everything disappears, what's the point? And I don't want to mm. be that way. Right, right, right. So I'm right. curious as you watched your mom go through this transition, like what did that do to you? You know, it was tough. There was a pivotal moment in that relationship with my mom where, you know, freedom is a really big value for me. Like, I just want to feel the inner freedom to be everything that I am. I don't like feeling caged at all, you know? And when I was younger, I, uh, I was, my nickname used to be passive. I know it sounds crazy because if, I mean, obviously I talk a lot and I share my feelings and I'll be honest and blunt. However, back in the day, I was so afraid of what people thought and I felt so caged on the inside and I knew I wanted to do more, but I was so afraid of failing or looking stupid or whatever that was, seeking the validation and all those things. And I realized I was crippled by fear. 
And when I was 17 years old, someone had put a book in front of me. Funny enough, it was a Dr. Phil book, which a 17 year old is like, <laughs> why do you have a Dr. Phil book? And my cousin's like, hey, you got to check this out. I was I'm, like, dude. I'm surprised Dr. Phil has done anything good. <laughs> I'm going to put that out there. Like, <laughs> like he wrote a book and it actually helped someone do something good. Yeah, it's that crazy. surprises me. <laughs> You know what's funny is I was even like, I took the book like, and eh, but I respected my cousin so much and I just took it and I flipped through the pages. The one thing that got me, I don't even know if I, I think I started to read it, but I was like, eh, I went to the, there was one section that had just questions and it would ask you a series of questions. And I was like, dude, if I could change, I don't want to feel caged. I don't want to feel insecure. I want to feel confident. I want to unleash. I want to live my life. I just did. I didn't like smiling on the outside and doing all this. And yet on the inside, I felt like, uh, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, just pleasing tap dancing, putting on a mask. And I was like, no, freedom is a big thing for me. And so I was like, if I could change, I'm going to discover it. And that's what got me on this pathway to personal development and understanding what is, you know, how does the mind work? How does neuroscience work? How does my subconscious mind work? How does, uh, you know, how did my trauma affect me? Or what is peak performance like? What does confidence come from? What does depression come from? What does anxiety come from? I went on this crazy journey. But when my mother um, had, had gotten diagnosed with cancer, I, you know, it was really weird, Mark, because it felt like the movies where the doctor's like, Hey, can you come into my office? And you're like, yeah, sure. You know, we're at the hospital. And he's like, Hey, so she has cancer and this is what's going on. And at that moment, I knew that my choices determined a lot of things and I could be, I could have emotion, but I didn't want to be caught up in my emotion. I wanted to be with it. So I could be the chooser of my life because I didn't want to be a puppet to circumstances, to things. I wanted to make the conscious choice because that's living to me. If I'm just living on an autopilot or as a robot or a puppet, is that really living? To me, it's not, right? And so I took a step back and I said, the decision I make right now will determine how I show up for my mom, how I show up for myself and for my family and for my life. And I don't know how this battle is going to look. So I made a decision and I decided in advance how I was going to show up for her. Don't get me wrong. I would go on my little drives and cry for a long time. But I, I witnessed my mother go down to 70 pounds, which was really hard for me because she was my best friend, my hero. <laughs> But this was the pivotal moment for me. I was in, I hope this isn't too deep, you know, but I, I'm sitting there holding her hand when she passed away. And I remember I have this thing sometimes I call the sacred pause, right? Where you, something happens and instead of being reactive, I pause, I take a breath and I'm, I, I, I become as present as I can. And I remember thinking, Henry, the decision you make right now will determine a lot of things in your life. Because my mom was my, my best friend. She was my safety. You know, we had a crazy life growing up. And I remember looking at her and I said, I have a decision to make and whatever decision I make will determine my destiny. You know, it sounds cliche, but to me, it was a true statement because I could have been bitter for the rest of my life. I could have just thought that life was against me. But I remember looking at her and I said, mom, and I said this out loud. I said, mom, I will honor your sacrifices with how I live my life. And that one decision man, just pivoted me, you know, and it was, and so I know how much she sacrificed for me. I, I just, you know, my parents aren't perfect, but it was like, I know how much she did. And I said, I will honor your life with how I live mine. And so to me, it was a de de decision, the power of decision-making that I get to choose my life. I can't choose what happens to me, but you better believe it. I want to choose how I react to what happens. Cause if I'm going to go through it, I might as well grow through it. I might as well evolve through it because what's well, my other option. Right. And so that th those moments were really pivotal for me, man. And what does that commitment to your mother look like in your life today? Um, it's a combination of expanding, magnifying, and utilizing my gifts to just give back to the world. Uh, when it's my time, I want to put it all on the table and say, okay, well, okay, okay. Well, would, that all sounds like awesome Instagram type stuff. What does that actually mean? It means. Uh, taking an inventory of the gifts that I believe, you know, for me, it's what God has given me, including, you know, my experiences, my, the years and years and years of obsession I've put into personal development and human behavior, um, my talents in speaking, singing, creating, gathering people. It's taking an inventory of who or what are the giftings that I have and what are the giftings that I want and how do I impact and show up in the world? that it's absolutely, I know it sounds so cliche, but it's really the truth is when I walk into that room, how can I add value? How can I love the person in front of me? It's really, how can I love the freaking hell out of life and people and things that because I was here, 
a difference was truly made. And, and I think so that's part of it. Another part is it, it goes back to the fear thing, man. That's why if you've, you know, whoever follows my account or my first TEDx talk was fear of freedom is I don't want to live boxed. I want to live unleashed with everything that I am. I want to take, I don't want to be like, oh, I was so afraid of like this thing that I didn't really show up. And, you know, I, it's like, no, like this is who I am in the best possible way. And I'll be better tomorrow, but I'm going to give it, I'm going to show up with everything that I can intentionally every day, not on autopilot, but deliberately choosing my life. And so um, it's utilizing my gift things and recognizing where my fear is blocking me from those gift things and working through those things so I can show up completely unleashed. And I don't know if that if that's yeah. No, it, it does. I want to get into fear to freedom because I know that's a big theme and uh, it's something that I struggle with a lot. But in the back of my mind, if I'm being skeptical, yeah, um, I'm thinking, you know what, <laughs> Henry just sounds like one of these guys who you know drank the Kool Aid, uh, right. loves the self help stuff, loves like is just like addicted to like pop psychology and loves it. And he's so into it that he then just goes out there and lives his life and runs his business and makes his money kind of like just evangelizing the thing that he's in love with. Now, the other side of me, because I play devil's advocate a lot, would say, well, how is that any different than, you know, like a pastor, <laughs> right? Who like, who literally is paid, their main job is to run the church and evangelize this message that they believe in. Um, but I've just met so many people in the personal development or self-help space who talks about, um, you know, manifesting, who talks about uh, conquering fear, who uses all the right words, um, who makes people kind of feel good. But then when you kind of pull back behind the scenes, you realize they're kind of full of shit. Right. And they're just like, <laughs> I can go ahead and sell this thing to these suckers because it'll make them feel good. I don't like that. I'm not saying that's you. Right, right. But, right. but, I, but someone listening who doesn't know you might be thinking the very things yeah. I just said. Absolutely. And, and for me, that's a really valid question. And I really commend everybody that's a coach or everybody that's trying to help people in whatever way that is, if your intent is sincere, right? Um, in, in all honesty, I hate seeing people suffer. I hated seeing myself suffer. I, it, it's really like I teach this because if you really plug yourself into my brain and you knew who I was back then and you knew the kind of insecurity and struggle and everything that it was back then, I could not stand life in that sense back then. Like, yeah, you smile on the surface, but I was like, no, man, I've seen too many people suffer. I've seen my family suffer. I've seen a lot of people suffer because of trauma too. There is so much more in-depth things that I think we need to understand as a personal development industry. I, I really believe that there, and, and this is going to divert a little bit, but I'll bring it back to your question, is there's too much emotional override. I was talking to some guy yesterday that was a part of one of my masterminds. He's like, Henry, I hired this coach and she told me, um, he was struggling with something and uh, she said, um, you need to get off your ass and get your shit together. And he, he was like, that did not make, he goes, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to do, but if you don't understand the nervous system and what really happens on a nervous system level, on a neurological level, on a physiological level, on a um, trauma informed level, you know, from understanding the aspects of human behavior, then a lot of people just focus on behavior, do, do, when the reality is there's, it's a deeper layer than that, right? And that's, I hope maybe this opens up the question of maybe I need to understand trauma, maybe I need to understand the nervous system and why we do what we do as beings, as human beings, right? As, as primal beings just trying to survive. Because what fear is you saying, I feel unsafe, so why does your body feel unsafe? What is the belief system? What is happening underneath the hood that your body is manifesting this lack of safety is fear of success, fear of failure, insecurity, worrying what people think about you, playing small, inauthenticity that I have to be somebody else. The list goes on and on, right? But unless we understand fear just means my body feels unsafe. My body feels unsafe means my nervous system is reacting. And when your nervous system is reacting, you have to dig beneath the layers to understand what's going on because you can just go behavior, overcome it, just focus on it. Man, feelings buried alive never die, right? There's like that, that book, but your feelings are in your body. And if you stuff them down, they're going to come back to kick you in the ass. And so what's the difference is a deep obsessive understanding of human behavior that I've spent the last 26 years in because I don't care about inspiration. I want results because I don't want someone to just quote unquote, inspire me, give me results, you know? And for me, it's like, 
it, it, that's the thing. And, and I invite anybody that is a coach, dive deeper, do the work to understand yourself deeper and other people. We're too afraid of emotions. We're too afraid of understanding what trauma really is, understanding why I do what I do. And we're too busy beating ourselves up into healing or just overcome it. Or I'm an idiot for not doing this. It's like, no, your body's doing exactly what it believes. It's adapting right, to what happened to you in the past or generationally. So to answer your question, there is layers, there is depth. And what makes me different is I don't give a shit about inspiration. I want results. And my obsessive study over 26 years has proven that it's all about results. And that's kind of my feeling is like, um, if I'm not the one giving you results, go to somebody that is because I'm, I don't want to just raw you back to the couch where you're not doing anything. <laughs> back to the couch. What, you know. what do you feel of this like counter movement to so so I feel like on one side of our world there's these this movement towards progression right more understanding more acceptance even some foundational things like like Carol Dweck's book mindset you know like like stuff that like is coming from universities and from yeah. studies and people are fighting up against it and so I feel like on one side there's a progression to understand more to um to help us understand mental health challenges and issues and to feel better and to work through these things. And I've seen a ton of personal progress on that side. And then on the other side, I feel like there's a certain amount of just like, my grandfather is 95. He was born in 1928. He survived losing everything as a refugee. He survived the Second World War. He came to Canada, you know, in his early 20s with nothing, worked for two years to pay off his debt and bring my grandmother over. And then he built a huge company over the course of like 50 or 60 years. He's worked his ass off. He's had cancer twice. Um, he's like done all these things. And when I go visit him, I'm like, how's it going? And he's just stoic, man. He's just like, he's the don't complain, don't explain generation. And when I try to like say like, well, what was it like, you know, when you were 10 and you lost your mom? He's like, it wasn't good. <laughs> and that's it. So like, like, don't explain, don't complain. Are we like, are we losing something though between like this move towards more and more understanding and more working through and more of all this stuff versus just maybe we just all need to, maybe that advice that coach gave was actually good advice though, right? Just get your shit together and get to work. It's good advice if it is an emotional override. It, studies even show that if you just stuff your emotions down, they will show up. They, they will, your body will be in dis-ease. A stress response is never healthy, right? If your body's in fight or flight mode all the time because you're stressed or you're stuffing it down and you're like, you know, and you don't understand how to manage or master your emotions, then you're going to be in a stress response your whole life. Your body's not made to live in a stress response your whole entire life, right? It's unhealthy for you physically. It's unhealthy for you mentally. And yeah, my parents, like same, my family came to this country two years before I was born, right? They had $200 in their pocket, didn't speak the language. My dad died at six years old of a heart attack, right? You know, um, and sure, your grandfather was older, but there, there is something to um, understanding and not feeling like you need, we need to bury anything that's going on. Um, again, I think that there's extremes, right? Where it's like, I'm just going to let my feelings overcome me, right? Being in my emotions or there's feelings of like, nope, I'm just going to bury everything down. But studies will even show, I mean, if you follow the likes of even Dr. Gabor Mati or a bunch of other people, and, and I'm not a, I, again, you have to say I'm not a licensed doctor or whatever, but you know, your body will be in dis-ease, right? And when your body's in dis-ease, it's like, it's just not a healthy thing to do to constantly be in a stress response. So if we don't, I, I just feel like you can, we can learn to have emotions, but not let them have us. If that's, you know, the, the line mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. um, I, I think emotional override is an extremely dangerous thing. And I think generationally, um, uh, we've suffered a lot from it because if you're in a survival state, it's hard to really love deeply if you're in fear. It's hard to do anything. I mean, <laughs> you know, like uh, when I was pre COVID, um, I didn't quite realize how bad my anxiety was. Um, and it, during the whole pandemic was when I actually went out and saw a therapist and got diagnosed with GAD, with the generalized anxiety disorder and started medication and things like that. And my kids, just the other day, one of my kids on the weekend was like, uh, you don't yell as much as you used to. And, and I'm like, oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's great. Awesome. You know, like I do, it, and what scared me most was like the thought of like, when they're, when, do you have kids? Do you have kids? I know you're recently married. But. Yeah, I just got married. She has two kids. So I became an incident dad last year, nine and six. Ah, so yeah. There you go. So like, um, so when they're really small, in my mind, I was kind of like, they're not going to remember any of this. <laughs> like I was, I could get a, I could get by, but 
uh, my oldest is turning 17. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, I've got like, I've got like a 15 year old and they're at the age where it's like, if they look back the last few years, if they look back, that's kind of their childhood. And what kind of home do I want it to have? And what kind of dad do I want to be? And, um, and I was just, you know, in fight or flight mode all the time. And I was just super amped up all the time. And the anxiety was like, it wasn't about them. It was just about all the stress that I was carrying. Right. And so I definitely kind of try to, I try to explain to my wife and I try to live this way where it's like, listen, you'd be stupid to try and fight the tide, right? Like you, you, it's way more work to swim against the current. It's way easier to just try and flow with it. Mm-hmm. And so I try to live that way a little bit more where I'm like, where I'm like just trying to be a little more in flow. Um, things kind of take as long as they take. Um, things kind of cost what they cost. Uh, the results are kind of the results that they are. And I'm trying to like, give up things a little more because I don't really have control over all those things. Right. Then I feel like, um, I'm not giving it my all the time. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Right. How do you live in that state where it's like, we're in flow. Um, but also we're not just like chilling. Yeah, this is, uh, I love this conversation, man. So I, I don't, it's probably going to deviate. And it's literally more conversation. My wife and I talk a lot about the masculine and feminine dynamic. And every, we even have it within us. The masculine part of us is the structure that the do, you know, action, get it done. And the, the feminine side is the be, the flow, right? You think of like water and the ocean rocks or the river, right? You set the structure in and then you kind of navigate with that. And I think everybody has both, right? We're dominant one or the other. Um, but building the infrastructure in your life, the certainty, the trust within yourself to be able to, um, organize, plan, do, you know, those things. And then also just trusting in the rest of it. One of the, the quotes that got me, uh, really through my mom's stuff was the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity, the peace to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can. And I point at myself and the wisdom to know the difference. Um, and so there is an energy of certainty within ourselves, you know, uh, even though life is a certain way, how do I create that certainty? Um, because we do want to trust because to me that flow is like, I trust in the timing. I trust in the cost. I trust in what it is because trust brings peace. And I think my question is in the flow is the intuition part, right? Like how do I just know what my job is and take aligned action and then trust the rest of it. Right. And so, um, there is that dynamic of both because you've interviewed people that are very high functioning anxiety, right? You interviewed people that are getting a lot of stuff done in their life. But on the personal side of it is like, if you can't be present and grounded and understand and be in the moment or whatever that is and have, go home to your family and be present and be there versus like it constantly being in a stress response. It's like, we probably need to pay attention to something. Right. And, and so I think when it comes to the masculinity, I think there are three things you absolutely need in order to get into a healthy, safe, masculine presence. And it's three, three things. One is power, right? It's the power to, to do. It's like that, but it's power under control, accessing every part of you, but it's under control, right? It's called meekness, right? Like that sword that sheathed, right? It's presence because if you're not present, you're caught up in the future, the past. And, and if you're caught up in the past or the future, you're probably going to be triggered into that and love. So presence, power and love, right? Love being, it's a love based life versus a fear based life because fear based power is destructive. Like you said, yelling, avoidance. Some people avoid, some people yell, right? Some people freeze, right? It's a love based presence because if you're in the, if you're around a, a masculine, say man, and they're there and they're present and you know, they're powerful, but they don't need to exercise. They're not flexing because they don't need to, but they're completely loving. There is a different energy in that room and a different safety in that family for the kids, for the wife, for whoever that is in your business. Right. And so I think of those three things and I look at it as, um, uh, let's just use a, a, a basketball team, for example. There's going to be moments where you're going to need the guy that's really aggressive that's going to go and grab the rebound, right? But there's going to be the time where you need a three-point shooter. Very different people, right? And so I, I have like my little dream team that I know when I need to call this version of Henry out, I do. I just got off stage in Serbia in front of like 35,000 people. It's a very different energy when I'm on stage. I'm like... 
you know, exit festival, make some noise. And I'm putting this energy out there to get this energy back. When I come home, I'm not telling my wife, babe, what's up? Make some noise. You know, like that's not like, maybe, maybe that's yeah. a really unique aspect of your relationship. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But she, she laughs, but sometimes she just needs to sit there and just be present. And so it's such a deep sense of self-awareness of what does Henry need at this moment? What does my wife need? What does my business need? And, and the goal to me is flexibility. The goal to me is flexibility. It's not rigidity, right? Fear puts you in a rigid state. You're going to react. React means react to act again. The etymology of react is to act again, to react the past over and over again, where you lose your agency, you lose your choice. The goal is to be in my choice and to be able to choose and be flexible enough because the most flexible person in the room is actually the most influential. The most flexible person in the room, when it's done out of love, is the most impactful because you're going to be able to go and not just get caught up in the energy of everything else, but you get to step into that presence of what needs to happen right now. What do I need? What does the world need? What do the people need around me? To me, that's power. That's love and that's presence. I can totally see what uh, our mutual friend, Amberly Lago, uh, I love her. Here. She's amazing. <laughs> For anyone who's gone way back in in the Mark Drager Show episodes, you'll know that we had Amberly on, um, and we share a really special. I feel like we share a really special connection, uh, Amberly and I, because um, a lot of what she went through. For those listeners who don't know, she uh, was hit by a, a car on a motorcycle and yeah. lost um, part of her leg, and then had to go through like years of surgery that led to all kinds of addiction issues and a lot of pain. Um, when I was young, when I was uh, in grade six, my mom uh, went went for a standard surgery. It got infected. She got gangrene. She lost part of her leg uh, for six years or six weeks. She was in the hospital. She almost passed. So when Amberly and I were kind of talking, it was interesting to me because Amberly, only a few years older than me, though, kind of went through what my mom went through. Wow. And I kind of went through what her daughter, uh, her wow. daughters and her kids had to go through. And we really connected well. But um what do you, what brings the two of you together? And I know you've spoken at her conferences. I know that she's been on your podcast. She's an amazing woman. But what brings the two of you guys together? That's amazing, man. Yeah. Amberly is a freaking walking angel, man. She is legit. And uh, we met... How did we even meet? I feel like I've known her for my whole life. She's one of those souls that you're just like, you're just good. You're just a good being, you know? Uh, it, it, um where did we? Oh, we met at a conference that I was speaking at and she was speaking at. Um, it was this really cool conference in Utah with like Jay Shetty, Mel Robbins, everybody was speaking there. And uh, I saw her across the room and both of us looked at each other and we're like, you have this like light around you and I want to say hello to you. And we just met and it was one of those things where you're like, I just have so much love for you. And she's such a good soul. We became friends after that. Um, you know, have gone through a, a ton of stuff together, been on the phones, you know, when things are hard and been on the phones when things are great. And, um, she is genuinely such a, a if go back and listen to episode of Mark and Amberly, man, I bet you it's so much gold. There's so much gold in it, man. She is real, you know? Um, so we, we became friends and she, I consider her like a sister to me. And, uh, um, her story is so inspiring and the resilience that she's shown in her life is just really cool. So when you find good people in your life, man, and you know, their hearts and you could feel their soul and, uh, you know, you nurture that relationship and I will go to hell and back for that woman, you know? So. And what makes in your mind, Ed, cause I'm curious about some of the behind the scenes, what makes Amberly different than the others you like, cause, cause you and I both know the other people who get up on stages and, uh, aren't quite as legit. <laughs> oh man, this, we can talk about that probably, but, but we, you know, there's a lot, man. It's, it's a really interesting industry to be honest. Just, like, just, I, you I know, think, the listeners, he's sweating right now. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, it's like, man, what do I say? But the reality is, uh, Amberly walks the walk in the most real sense. Um, I know right now if I text Amberly and said, Hey, Amberly, I'm struggling with something. There's no question that I would get a phone call within a few seconds of her seeing that. And genuine, what can I do? A genuine, Hey, I love you. What do you need? It, there's, it's not BS. It's so real. And you, it, it comes from a space of genuine care. And to me, listen, man, I hope 
that everybody that does this work, you know, and I'll, I'm going to tell you a story about myself and I, I'm talking about myself. Everybody that does this work, does it for the right reasons, right? I was in a boy band back in the day and I am so like, we had worked with some of the greatest producers, some of the greatest names. Um, we were on these big stages, blah, blah. We were supposed to be the next big thing. Right. And then something happened and, uh, it hit the wall. And I look back, Mark, and I'm like, I am so glad we didn't blow up as big as they said we would. They put so much money. We had the dopest features on our record. And, um, you know, we, it was cool. We got to open for big people. We were on this album with Gladys Knight that won a Grammy. It was awesome, right? But I look back at my life and I'm like, thank you, God, for not letting you blow up because the glory was for Henry. I was so significance driven that when I was on stage, yes, I was battling. I want to help people, but it was also like, hey, Henry's here. And then you just go through life and you're like, man, this isn't, no, man, I, this isn't it. Um, and after I am Amberly, and I'll, I'll just say with Amberly, I genuinely know she cares. And I hope that everybody in our industry does it for that reason, you know, does it for that. And if there is any driven for significance or ego, I hope that we can let love lead the way and not that need for ego or fear or whatever that is. Um, like you said, I've been really disappointed with some people in this industry. Um, when I see behind the scenes, I'm like, oof. Oh man, I really liked you, you know? Um, but there's a lot of really amazing people in this industry, people that really care. And, um, Amberly is definitely one of those people for sure. Thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask and dig a little bit into that because I've been thinking the last few weeks about, um, colleagues who are not really colleagues, friends who are not really friends, you know, business people who are not really business people, you know? And, um, uh, I was in England a few weeks ago with my wife. And we had a friend drive like four and a half hours to come and see us, spend the day with us, rented a hotel room. I'm headed back the next day. And that just made me feel so, um, I don't know, like, like appreciated it and loved. Yeah. And I can think back through my previous, you know, and, and this is someone who helps me with business. We speak every week, we strategize, but it's like more than that. Like we're friends and we're there for each other. And, and there's a bunch of people in my life right now. A few of them you've had on your podcast recently, even. And um, I know that they are there for me, even though they're in North Carolina or even though they're in the UK or even though they're all over the place. Yeah. Um, and it's strange because I feel like the 300 plus clients I've worked with in the past and all of the people, I've had that, but it was always a bit, more professional, like, like you were saying, like the whole, not necessarily tap dancing, but making sure that I showed up the way that, that they needed me to show up in a right. professional way. Right. And they would say, we're friends. And I would think, well, we're kind of friends, but right, right. if I was doing something, <laughs> they wouldn't show up, you know, like, like I, you come from the entertainment industry. I've never done a hard launch on anything because I know how hard it is to get people to show up to something. Mm -hmm. And I would never, like, I was just did not want to risk doing a hard launch, doing this big thing, and then have no one show up, which just proves to you how insignificant you really are. <laughs> and then I go to England and I have these friends who come and visit me and I like, and we want to do stuff. And it's like, but this comes from this world of entrepreneurship, of self-help, of development, the people who have yep. done the work, the people who are there. And they are very few and far between. And yet, once you find those people, it's like you're not alone anymore. Do you know yeah. what I mean? A hundred percent. I love that, man. Uh, my second text talk, I highly recommend you just, it was totally inspired. It was bigger than me. You know, it was definitely bigger than me when I got the concept of it. It was on a book I'm working on. It's called Love Based Boundaries. And it's the concept of boundaries aren't yes or no. Boundaries are proximity. How much, how close you have your inner circle. Those are the people that will come to your hotel, come get a hotel next to you. Mark needs something. Hey, dude, no question. I'm right in front of you. Like, for example, one of the guys in my inner circle, my mother had passed away that night that I was talking about. He didn't tell me, he drove 45 minutes. This is 1 a.m., parked outside of my house, didn't tell me he was there, but kept texting me every 20 minutes in case I needed him, but didn't want to tell me he was there because he didn't want me to feel obligated to let him in. Like those kind of people that are, that show up for you, the inner circle people, right? The people that value the same things you do that are, Generally there, And then you have the, you know, as they go further along, you have the different proximity and not maybe because they're bad or good people. Maybe they're just not capable of loving you the way that you want your inner circles to love you, or maybe their values are different. And I think in life, sometimes, you know, I used to get so upset when someone 
It was like a yes or a no. Oh man, you're not all here for me. It's like, no, you know, you're probably like three rings back and that's okay. That's the best that our relationship is right now. And maybe we'll grow closer or maybe we won't, you know? And I think time and experience and energy tells whether we get closer or not. Like when I first met Amberly, we were like a little bit further on the, the, you know, the, the proximity. But when we started going in together, when I was able to meet, I went over to her house, met her family. We broke bread together. We cried on the phone together, right? Those brought us closer together. And when I look at her, our values are very similar. We value love, truth, you know, all these particular things, open, honest conversations. You know, so the more we, our values align, the more experiences we have, the more, as you said, I feel safe being who I am and being open with all that I am around you, the more you're probably going to be in my inner circle, right? And you may be a little proximity out. And so I love that you said that. Because there are people that those people that you're talking about, those are your inner circle ride or dies, you know? And then you have some people that you're like, eh, you're like, cool. You're like a relation, limited relationship or a close relationship. And that's okay. Cause that's where we're optimally going. But when I expect you to be more than what you're capable of or more than what we are is when pain comes in and when our relationship gets hurt. I feel like the more you can be that open and honest with people, I often want to go straight from. Like, here's where I am to the finish line, right? Yeah, but yeah. I feel like the more <laughs> open and honest you are with people, that this is like a really slow progress and, and you don't even notice some of the stuff, but you know, you're a little bit more open with them. You find people who are aligned with your values a little bit better. They want the same things. You feel more comfortable sharing some more. They don't get it, give it, they don't give you a negative response or shut you down. And then suddenly you're a little bit more comfortable. And then before you know it, like you're building confidence, you're being more bold, you're saying yes to more things. They're, it's almost like this feedback loop that um, could go <laughs> incredibly wrong. But when you get it right. right, it helps you become the person that you want, you need to become. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, man. You know, I love that. And one thing I sense from you, and I, you know, again, we just, we're getting to know each other, is I, I think radical honesty is good. It's important to you, right? I, I could tell because you ask the questions that will come this way so you can get the full picture of what the answer is, right? You ask the, the both sides of the question, which to me shows, it's hey, I my gift I want, and my curse. Right, I, I love <laughs> my it. gift is I can see almost all sides of everything. My curse is, <laughs> dude, don't ask me to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's great. And, and I think we hear the phrase, the truth will set you free. And I, I agree with it on, in the, under the condition of truth and love will, is what sets you free. I think we need to create a loving, safe enough space to have radical honesty be productive. But I, I'm all about radical honesty. And that's where the self-awareness comes in. In this relationship, where am I at? Where are they at? what's really there. Let's be really honest. And the more, that's why the more present we can be, the more honest that I know myself, I can know what isn't, isn't right and is right in those relationships in my life. I can be aware of my emotions and be like, something is really tense in my body. Why do I feel tense right now? Why do I feel stressed? Every time I talk to Bob, every time around him, I feel like this. Is it what belief system am I operating? Is it that person? Does my nervous system feel unsafe around them? Are they too close in proximity? Are they too, you know, so the radical loving self-awareness is a foundation for everything, man. And that's why I think if we just walk around, you know, emotional override and stuffing everything down and I'm just going to do this, it's like, we may miss out on some beautiful things in life. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have some people too close and some people too far. So how do you know if you're doing this right or not? <laughs> I, I, I think it's flexible. I don't know that we're always doing it perfectly right, but I think it's a it's an honest assessment of, you know, let me look at, for example, if it has to do with people. For me, this is just my personal, like Henry's thing. I, I, I do an evaluation every week with myself. Every Sunday night, I tell my wife, hey, let's just go through. I look at how did I spend my time? Who did I spend my time with? How did I feel the majority of my week? What was my emotional home? Right. Um, where's, where am I at right now? What am I really like? What is my body really scared of or what am I nervous about? I just get really honest with myself and I create such a safe place to be honest without criticizing myself of like, this is where I'm at. And the flexibility of that gives me freedom to, to make changes because I never want to go on autopilot so much that I miss out on like being a creator of my life. Like I know this sounds like it's another phrase, but I don't want to live in survival. You know, I don't want to just live 
a, a, afraid. It's like, no, I want to create my life. Who do I really like? For example, our mutual friend, Steve Scoggins, right? <laughs> Steven, yeah. right? That's when you said North Carolina, I figured that's who you meant. You were like, ah, right? oh, I know, I know Steven. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I met Steven. We sat next to each other. We had such an honest, beautiful, open conversation, talked about life and God and spirituality and this and that. And I said, you know, I'm going to be intentional about this relationship. We're going to stay in touch a little bit more. I just would love to nurture this. I think I, I, he's a great guy and I want to know how I, and genuinely, how can, how can we create a, a very loving, elevating relationship? And, um, you know, he came out to each other, you know, a, a couple of months ago or a month or two ago, whatever. And, you know, we poured into each other. And for me, it's like just being aware of, of, of life, of, huh, I just met Mark cool. Like, I'm excited to see where this goes. We're going to, we're going to run into each other again. What, where's that going to go? What is that going to lead? You know? And granted, this is our first time meeting and they're still like, is he not? It's like just being honest. But oh, now like, I'm curious. Is he or is he not what? <laughs> right. No, no, it's just like where I believe everything crosses our path for a reason. I believe in divine choreography, you know? And, you know, when I meet certain people, I'm like, huh, okay, God has placed me in each other's path for a reason. How can I genuinely be there? How can I love? How can I serve? Did I add value to Mark's life today? Did I add value to his listeners, to someone listening right now? Like, to me, it's just loving curiosity, man. And I think how, um, not to the place where I'm like overly like questioning, overthinking my life, but it's like, what was good about today? What do I want to do tomorrow instead? It's like, there's a level of choice that comes into life when I think about people in my life. And just being honest, man, is there someone that when I'm around them consistently, I feel tense, I feel anxious, I feel stressed. If that's the case, your body's telling you something. And so radical honesty and self-awareness about what am I feeling? And what's beneath that feeling is emotions are messengers, not dictators, right? Mm. If we don't listen to the message, they're going to keep showing up. So what is the message of my body to myself? And that's the question. If I feel an emotion, I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Why did I feel that? What is happening there? And I just get curious and it's just, it's to me, it's fun because I get to choose who and when and what and how, like it's life, you know? So that was my rant. I just went on a rant. I don't even know what the question was, to be honest. <laughs> that's, so. that's the whole point of the show. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. literally doing what we brought you on to do. So. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, yeah. So in terms of your podcast, Making It Happen with Henry Amar, um, you had... <laughs> what, did you like that? <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> uh, you've had, uh, I mean, a ton of people on it, but even in terms of your background, right? Like, you know, you talked about being in a boy band and being in music. Uh, you started a company and you mentioned that you kind of sold your share in that and went back to school to business school and worked in uh, real estate investing. And so you've done like a ton of different things. And for those who have a jack of all trades and have something to teach and something to share and love connecting with people like you and I do, uh, we start a podcast. Yeah, um, But I think what a lot of listeners may not realize is how many of the little lessons we learn behind the scenes. Oh, man. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, like I, I want to learn from you. What are some of the things that you've picked up and learned along the way um, just from, you know, starting the podcast in 2017 and keeping it going for all these years? Yeah, man. Thanks for asking. I would love to learn from you. I, you know, it's awesome. It's, um, I, for me, the lessons that I've learned when I first started my podcast, I just jumped into it. I had no clue. Like if you go back to my first episode, I don't have an intro. It's like, I think I record, I don't know what I recorded it on. Sounds like yeah. a phone. <laughs> yeah. 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 Seriously. You're like, you just do it and nobody was listening and you're like, is this thing on? You know what I mean? And I did it for like maybe two months and I said, something's not working. Something's not right. And it's the power of pivot and understand and, you know, understanding who you're serving, understanding, you know, how to best serve them. Um, because a podcast is knowing what value you want to add. It's marketing, it's branding, it's, you know, to me, it's adding real value to people because you're going to take 30 minutes to an hour of their time. And so I launched my podcast in the beginning and I was like, no one's really listening. And, 
you know, you think you're going to just launch it and everything's going to be great. And you're like, no, like nobody knows about it. Nobody knows the value it's adding. Um, I paused. I asked myself the question. I said, who are you serving truly? What value do you really want to give people? And I was like, you know, I just want to give people a podcast that I wish I would have listened to when I was feeling insecure and stuck and bound in fear. And it was really interesting, man. I, um, I paused and I came back in it with a different intention of, because you launch. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, I'm launching a podcast. And it was about the podcast. And then when it was about the podcast, nothing happened. But it was, a, but then I came back when it, I made it about the people, the person, the, even the one person listening. And I had learned this lesson because it was so funny. I quit my real estate job. Um, I was grateful enough to be a director of investments for a $2 billion company. I had the ocean view office, the sexy title, the sexy office, all the beautiful things. Right. Um, and I quit and I was like, you know what? I'm going to launch this and it's going to be amazing. Cause I just know you're know, just going to do it and make it happen. Right. Whatever that is. And you go and, and I launch and nothing happens. Yeah. Month crickets, month. Right? <laughs> yeah you're like, dude, I, I was like, I'm going to do some really amazing content. I have a really creative idea. I had 395 followers on my page and 394 were probably my friends being nice, right? And so I, it was the power of asking myself questions and saying, okay, just because I'm not there now, I know what I want to do. I know I'm here to add this particular value. Let me start getting smarter and asking better questions. And Mark, this was really interesting. And for anybody, wherever you're starting... There was one moment where I went live on Instagram and, and this will lead into your question. I went live on Instagram and, um, I promised myself I would go live. And I felt like it was the worst thing I'd ever done. I was like, I felt like I was just doing that. Right. And nobody, like, it was like four people, three people came on. Right. I don't even know how many people came on, but I promised myself I was, I was going to, there's two painful things with IG lives is waiting for people to come in. Yeah. And then realizing no one is coming. <laughs> and yeah. You just got to fill time. Yeah. And then they come in and leave and you're like, wait, one, zero, two, zero, one. You know, and you're like, I used to have that on Clubhouse all the time. You'd launch the Clubhouse <laughs> room and you'd be like, just waiting for the room to heat up. Okay. And then you're like, oh, okay. I got an hour to fill. There's three people here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what's crazy is we think about these three people. And this is a lesson that it taught me is I promised myself I would post it. I literally did it. It was like a four minute live. It was like, I, I stopped because I felt like I was gibbering. I was like, is that even a word? Gibberishing? But I was, whatever that is. And dude, I signed it off and I just hit post and I just turned off my thing. And I was like, man, what am I even doing? Why am I doing this? I feel like this sucks. And all of a sudden I get this DM. And this guy's like, Hey man, I just want to say thank you for going live. Um, I was, I came home from school with the intent to take my life, but I saw your Instagram live and oh, shit. Uh, he, he goes, you saved my life. I want you to know you have a much more loyal follower from India. And I was like, the thing that I thought sucked when I thought no one was listening, did something more important than anything that I could have done with a thousand people listening if they didn't do that. So the goal is, What's my intent? How can I add the most value? What are, you know, just being totally authentic and honest, how do I show up? Because, I, you know, I grew up in an era where everything had to be polished and real. And my kid, da, 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 da. Yeah. hey guys, Henry Mar, if you go back to some of my stuff, dude, seriously, some of my stuff on YouTube, they're making it happen, make it happen dot life stuff. Is it, I look back, I'm like, oh man. I'm like, what's up, everybody? This is Henry Mar from Make It Happen. Dot life. And I'm all the, it's like this performance thing. And I'm like, Henry, like, I get that's what you used to do because you're used to being on stage. You're used to doing this. Like, people want your heart. People want the truth. People want to feel loved. They want to feel seen and they want to know that you connect with them. And so for me and my podcast, it's been really fun because I've had the most diverse group of people from like Flavor Flav to like a neuroscientist, right? But as you have too, you've had a really great lineup on your podcast, man. It's awesome. And I just realized, man, you and I are two human beings doing life. We're, we're literally, you go home, you have your ups, you have your downs. I have my ups, I have my downs, I have my struggles, I have my ambitions. But all anybody is that you see, man, I've had the blessing of working with some people that everybody knows, or major a lot of people in the world know as a coach, as someone, as a mentor, as an, as a consultant or whatever advisor, whatever that is. Like who? Um, there's some people I can't say just because of 
confidentiality, uh, mental health stuff. Yeah. Like, but that have struggled with mental health, you know, that have struggled with mental health. Like there was one person and this person, I absolutely can't say, um, but they were on the top of the billboard charts, right? Like, but they were on in front of everybody. They're like, Hey guys, you know, we're at life was great on Instagram, but when they turned it off, the struggle, the depression, the anxiety, the, um, uh, the depth of darkness that they were in, it was two different people. Yet they never wanted anybody to know their struggle. And to this day, it's they're open a little bit more, but they still don't want anybody to know their struggle because we live in this performance-based society when they're just another human being that happens to succeed in one way. Mm. You know? Um, and, and that's the interesting part, man, is... is I, think, I think we can all feel like... I don't know. For, I, I can't speak for the whole audience. But man, I feel like I've been in that trap before. I remember I used to be in a mastermind group with my friend Evan Carmichael. And at a certain point, the way that you do when you're around people, you like you want to not only support one another from a mastermind point of view, but you want to work together. And so yeah. he, he, one of his businesses became my client. And as soon as one of his businesses became my client, I felt not comfortable revealing a lot of the holes in my business. Because he's a client, like, you know, and so I'm playing along and playing along. I think it's like a year and a half later. And finally, one night or whatever, I was just like, I'm just going to be honest with you. And like, here's all the ways that I think my business are broken or we're not doing a good job or we're letting you down or we're letting clients down or all of this stuff. And I remember I just like cried for like an hour (laughs) because not so much admitting it or saying it out loud, but that it just didn't bother him. Like he was just Mm -hmm. like, cool, we can like, we could totally, why did you wait a year and a half? Like we could totally fix this. Wow. Um, And so for that person who's on the top of the billboard charts, who doesn't have that person, for the person listening right now where you feel like you've got to go to work every day or you have to show up to the PTA thing or you have to fake it for everyone else, for the family, for the in-laws, whoever it is, um, I think we all wear those masks too much and you need to find the person like I did with, was able to do with Evan or this person's able to do with you, but you need to find the person where you can let that down and and be able to connect and be like, "This this is all the stuff that's really shitty and broken. Because once yeah, you get it out loud, you realize, and someone can help you, you realize it's not really, like, honestly, most of the time, it, it's stuff you can work around, or you Dude, can let go of, or you can change. I am so glad you said that. I am so glad you said that. Um, th- there's even a, a term in, in the, the psychology field called co-regulation. And it's one of the most powerful ways to heal our traumas. It's one of the most powerful ways to work through life. And if you think about us primarily, if say Mark is walking through the, the forest and there's a, there's, you know, let's go primal. There's a lion and you're walking by yourself and you're dealing with life by yourself. You're going to feel a lot more fear and more stress. We're like, no, I have to be the one to do it. But when you have a crew of people that you know have your back and you're walking through life and there's a safety uh, between you all, your nervous system will be much more regulated. You'll be able to do more, process more, heal more, strengthen more. Um, there is a true, um, power to co-regulation to a a good group of people. And I love how you say we can do hard things. And for a lot of people doing hard things is letting people in. The hard thing is if you're doing it by yourself, that's not doing the hard thing. That's doing something that it's like, I want to scratch my ear. So I'm going to scratch it like this. It's like, I don't have to do the harder thing. I can just do hard things. Right. And I could do hard things much better when there are people around me that love and support me that I could be honest with. Because when someone is there with me, I walk differently, man. And I, I get it. I'm a, I'm, we, we have way too many lone rangers that are in this industry or in the world trying to do good. Too many lone rangers as men that don't feel like, Oh, I can't share what I feel. It's like, my gosh, man, we weren't made. Our primal being is that made to operate in isolation. You know, isolation is the opposite of a regulated nervous system. When you're, or feeling confident or feeling empowered, if I walk down this street and I know these people have my back, I'm going to walk very different, you know? And so I'm so glad you said that, man. And um, so if you are a Lone Ranger, please take what Mark said. And, you know, if there's not anyone there right now, find people that, that can be that safety. And if you've been hurt before and you're putting a wall up because you don't want to feel hurt again, the same walls that keep pain out are the same walls that keep love out, the same walls that keep support out, the same walls that keep more success out, the same walls. It's not about walls. It's about doors. Let the right people in, you know? So 
<laughs> I can tell Thank why you're so good that. At that this. was awesome. That, I love that you said that. <laughs> well, uh, you've mentioned nervous system like five times, I think, on on this podcast. Is that like really what this is all about? You know, it's about um, being able to manage this very physical thing that's happening within us that we often don't even think about. Yeah, I, I do. I I think that there's if you think about it, like if you know, you can hear your thoughts, right? It means you're not your thoughts. There's a primal part of you and like call it your spirit self, higher self, conscious self, mindfulness, whatever you want to, prefrontal cortex, whatever you want to call it, right? There's a difference when you're more, you're not in the primal state. You're not just running this fear-based life. You're living more of a present conscious love-based life. Um, if we're not aware of what our nervous system needs and we're not aware, Dr. Stephen Poor just says something really cool. He says, um, we don't have bad behaviors. We have adaptive behaviors, right? So what if all the processes and responses you've been doing have been just adaptive to what's happened in your life or the belief system you have in your life or generationally what's happened to your generations, right? Um, and so even in, while you're in the womb with your mother, what's happening, what's happening with her, right? There's a lot of stuff that affects us with the way that we walk through life. What belief systems do we have? Some people, for example, like there's a guy that I was working with and he's like, man, I just procrastinate. I'm just a procrastinator. I was like, no, procrastination is a, tr- is a trauma response. It's a for perfectionism it, usually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfectionism is also like, you know, this is a, I'll divert right back to what I was saying, but uh, in writing one of my books that I'm going to release, this phrase came to me. It says, your weaknesses are your strengths with fear attached to them. And so you think about yes. perfectionism. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, Perfectionism, I have a high ambition, but add the fear of if I don't do this right, then I am a loser. I'm not good enough. I'm going to be isolated. I'm going to be alone. I'm not going to survive. Then it becomes perfectionism. Now it's your downfall. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, we have this process of... Man, my but my body is just doing what it knows to do to keep me safe and connected to people. So if I can understand that and teach myself, as Mastin Kip would say, how to feel safe in all aspects of things that are coming forward, right? Like my nervous system, it's safe enough for me to go and do something and fail. And I'm going to be more, more willing to do that, right? The guy I was working with that I was talking about, the procrastination guy, his belief was... Okay. Well, I said, if you don't procrastinate, you do something. We got into like the subconscious work that we do. I'm all about under the hood, man. And he had his belief that if I do something, then I will fail. If I fail, I'm not enough. If I'm not enough, why am I here? I'm going to lose connection from everybody. And why am I here? So doing it was equated to death for him, isolation and death. Because if he did, he was going to fail because growing up for him, what did his, you know, his father probably good intention was, Whenever he failed, he would he felt like he lost connection with his father. So what did he learn growing up? What did his body adapt to? Don't fail. And so that equated to don't do. That equated to procrastination. And that equated to, you know, manifesting what he was afraid of. Yeah. And once you start to dig into this stuff and you start to know what these fears are, how do you address them? And the reason I ask that is I went for a walk maybe about a a year ago. And and I had this realization that like, I, my ambition, like, like most entrepreneurs, most visionaries, I I know what good is. And I know what bad is. I have tastes. um, I have uh, expectations. And everything that I want to have happen typically has to happen by someone who's better than me. (laughs) Mm. I'm just going to be honest, right? Like, like either one person can't do it alone, or a team can't do it alone, or there's not enough time, or there's not enough budget. Um, or whatever. It's just to do great things, you need all of the stars to align and everything to happen. And so often um, I go like, okay, if these are my expectations and I need to trust other people to help me with these things, I don't trust that I'll be able to find the people or that they'll say they can do it, but they won't, or they just won't be able to do it. And if I can't find those people, then I have to step up and do it alone. And if I do it alone, I know it won't be good enough. And if it's not good enough, then then everything fails. And the word I gave someone, like the promise I gave that I will help you, I will do this for you, I will take care of this for you, I will let them down. Right. So it took me a lot of work to be able to figure out, oh, that's what I'm so afraid of. Like, Like to do great things needs others. 
I don't trust that others will actually have my back and do it for me. Therefore, I'm going to be left alone. If I'm alone, it won't be good enough. If it's not good enough, I'll let people down. Dude, that's amazing that you, you got to more of a route. That's <laughs> incredible, well, man. That was a year ago. I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. I, you know, first of all, a side note quote that I love that Bishop T.D. Jake says, he says, if your goal can be done by yourself, it's not big enough, which I love. Um, but that's that was a different concept. Um, but, you know, to me, the first understanding of what those fears that come up are is what you resist will persist, right? If I'm pushing this away, I want you to think of it this way. Think of these fears as a younger version of yourself that's inside of you. That like, say, little Henry had this experience, which I'll give you a perfect example of it. Little Henry had this experience where whenever Henry spoke up at home, he would dysregulate the home and his dad would get mad and throw something across the house. So what did little Henry learn to do? Don't speak up. Just don't speak up because you will dysregulate people you love. You lose connection. You'll be alone because you can't. And so I formed this belief system. But if you think of little Henry, what he really wanted was connection, attention, love to feel safe. A lot of times we beat ourselves up into healing. We find these parts of ourselves like, oh man, can't believe I'm like that stupid Henry. Oh gosh, man. It's like, no, the first level is acceptance, right? Okay. My body was adaptive. It's very valid that you feel that way because if your previous experiences, whether consciously or subconsciously have been, people come in and let you down and you're stuck with it alone, you might as well just do it yourself. You're afraid of losing money. You're afraid of losing credibility, whatever that is. You, we understand that that's just an adaptive behavior. And so I, I need to look into um, what is that part of me, right? What does it really need? What is it really feeling? And so this story that Mastin Kip gave, I mentioned him earlier, is great. Um, he gave his story. He said, imagine three mothers in a, in a grocery store and the, first, the kids screaming and yelling and like, dis, you know, feeling dysregulated. The first mom's like, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. I can't believe you're like this. This is so dumb. Look at what's happening because of it and gets into a total like fight response, right? The second mother, you know, she, her kid's getting dysregulated. She like grabs the kid, like takes it away, walks away, just kind of leaves what she was supposed to get done and just kind of, you know, runs away from the scene and doesn't really fully address it. Um, but, you know, kind of masks it. But the third mother goes down to the eye level of the child and says, my son or my daughter, what is it that you really need right now? I know you're feeling dysregulated. What is it that you really need? And which mother in the long run is going to have greater results? It's the third one. Why? Because our inner being, what it needs the most is to feel that safety and to feel seen and to feel understood. But if we're rejecting ourselves, we're actually doing the same thing to ourselves that caused that behavior to show up in the first place. So the first thing is, how do I lovingly understand and accept myself with grace? Acceptance doesn't mean you allow it to stay. Acceptance means let me bring it in and begin to get lovingly curious, to get honest about, oh, this is an adaptive behavior. Now I begin the process. And to me, the, the loving identification phase is first, right? Then you go through the process of understanding emotions, emotional understanding and mastery. What's the message of this emotion? How do I get so certain and present? And then you do the work to me of healing the past and reprogramming yourself to let your, your body know that, wait a minute, I give myself a corrective emotional experience. This is what it's going to take. This is what my body needs to okay. begin. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. I, I hear what you're saying and I'm not yeah, sure yeah, I understand. Yeah. So like, okay. so like, uh, well, use my example, right? Okay. So I have this fear that people will let me down. It won't be good enough. I'll let other, I'll let the people that yeah, make promises yeah. down. What, what do so I do with this? First, I love you, myself and say, you're not alone. <laughs> what, do yeah. I, what do I so do? So how do you feel about the fact that you feel that way? Uh, how do I feel about the fact that I feel that way? I don't yeah. like it. I want to be more trusting to people because I know to be able to hit my goals, I can't continue to um, be untrusting. Like I just, right. I can't build what I want to build if I don't have great people who have my back. Right. And when you saw that part of yourself, when you initially feel that part of yourself, do you, um, so, so that's where you are. That's where you recognize, okay, I don't trust people. And where you want to be is you kind of need the GPS where you really want to be is I want to build a team. I want to build trust and I want to be able to feel like I don't have to do everything on my own. Yeah. I, I don't want to feel so exposed. Right. I want to know that there's that, that, I kind of have this idea where like, I don't have to worry about it if someone I trust is worrying about it. Right. So, and so right now I got to worry about everything and I don't want to. <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so for example, when you feel that feeling of not wanting to let people in, where do you feel it in your body? 
where do I feel in my body? Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I'll have like, to go to go to, like, imagine yourself right now about to hire somebody and bring them in mm-hmm. and your body's screaming like, dude, Mark, don't do it. Like they're just going to let you down, you know, and you go and you're, you're about to put yeah. up some money. Ooh, my heart hurts. My chest hurts. <laughs> right. So you feel it in your body. So usually our emotions yeah. are stored somewhere in our body. So what I do to really understand myself is, okay, where do I feel this in my body? Because I always feel it somewhere, right? For you, it's your chest. And let's just, uh, what I like to do is I like to almost objectify it so I could have a third party, like I'm speaking to a younger version of myself. So I want you to imagine feeling it in your chest, right? And I'm going to ask you some random questions and I want you to give me the first answer that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Pick a number one through 10. Go. A five. Okay. Pick a number 10 through 20. Go fast. Uh, 13. Okay. Now cut me off in this question. Pick a number one through 20. Go. God, as fast as you can. Pick a number one to 20. Go. Uh, 19. Okay. I want you to answer questions without thinking the way that I, you just did right now. Okay. I'm going to ask you some other questions. So I want okay. you to go to that feeling in your chest. Yeah. And so if anybody's listening, let me tell, I'm going to explain to you why I'm doing what I'm doing is because our goal is to understand. Our goal is to understand first, right? And so I want you to imagine this part of you and I I don't really normally dive this deep. It's going to be awesome. So I want you to imagine if it had an image, if that feeling in your chest was an image, what image would you see? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Uh, A ship. Okay, perfect. Trust it. And so is the ship big or small? Like a massive sailboat. Okay. Is it moving or still? It's on rocky waters, I think, because I just have been reading Moby Dick. Okay, <laughs> so perfect. I'm going to say just, that's probably influencing me. Yeah, just trust. So it's on rocky waters, um, yeah. and then is it clear or fuzzy? Uh, clear. Okay, now just trust with the first sense that it comes to your mind. Yeah. I want you to ask this ship. If the ship had a name, what's the first name you give it? First thought. Andromedas. Okay, Andromedas. Okay, I want you to ask this part of you. How old does it think you are? What's the first thought you hear? Uh, 14. 14. I want you to ask this ship, how old does it think it is? First thought. 200 years. 200 years. Okay. Now this is going to seem interesting. What I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to ask this ship. It sounds really weird, man. But if you could speak to it and understand it. You want me to ask it? Yeah, ask it as if it's a third party. Hey, Andromedus, can I speak to you? And do you understand me? Just to understand him. Is it okay? Is it, a, is it okay, okay if you speak with him? Is it for me? Yes. Yes. To him. Ask okay. him, is it okay if I speak with you? Oh, is it okay if I speak with you? Why, yes, Mark, of course you okay, can. Perfect. That's the ship's voice. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. <laughs> so what I want you to do for a moment is I want you to literally just take a deep breath. Yeah. And I want you just to notice the ship and I want you to just almost put it out in front of you so you could speak to it as a third party. And now that it's in front of you, did the image change or did it stay the same? Um, the, the waters are calm, but okay, it's perfect. the same. Yeah. It makes sense. But the waters are calmer, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I want you to ask the ship now what it's there. We know that ship, that emotion is there because it wants to benefit you for some reason, right? Every emotion has a positive intention. So I want you to ask this part of you, what positive intention does it want for you? What's the first thought you hear? Uh, safety. Perfect. And I want you to ask it safety for what reason? For what purpose? You want me to ask it that? Yeah. S- uh, why do you want to give me safety? For what purpose? What was the first thought for you what, hear? For what purpose? Um, I don't know. I'm thinking about the exercise now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going through. <laughs> That's okay. Are you okay with doing this? Because this is... You're I actually totally right. am. The okay. reason why I was like, ooh, let's see how this works. Okay. Um, so, so ask it safety for what intention? What's the first thought you hear? Safety for what intention? Um Protection for what intention? If you're protected, what does it want for you when you're protected? It just it just wants me to it just wants me to know that it's okay. Perfect. And when you know that it's okay, what positive benefit does it want for you when you know that it's okay? Then I can just calm down. When you're calmed down, what's even more important than calming down that it wants for you? First thought. Um just um like margin. Is that, I don't know what the word is. Um like space. Space. So like having space. So when you have space, what positive benefit does it want for you by having space? First thought. The ship. What does the ship want me to have? Yeah. What positive emotion or what emotion does it want you to feel in that space?
I don't know. Okay. And so, do, so do take, people do, usually like answer these questions like it just comes to them or no? People do, some people don't. So just, just go back into it for a second. You, no, no, you'll no. get the point of this at the very end and I'll show you something really cool that'll come out of this. You're okay. actually doing this perfectly right because safety is always the first, usually the first intention for it. It wants to keep you safe, right? Mm. But there's always layers beneath the safety because it wants something more positive for you. It wants to keep you safe for a higher intention. So our goal is to understand what is it really looking for? Right. So, and, but here's the thing: I'm getting some responses, but I know that's me directing it. Like, yeah, I, so, like I know that I'm kind of directing it to the way that I want it to go, and I'm trying not to do that. Yeah, that's great. So, I want you to just take a deep breath again, and I want you to talk to it and just tell me the first thought that comes to mind, even if it doesn't make sense. So, say so you want me to be safe, to feel protected, right? To be able to just have that space. Say when I'm safe and protected, and I'm open and free in that space. What positive intention do you really want for me? <laughs> have fun. Have fun. Perfect. And that's amazing. So have fun. And when I have fun, what's the most important thing you want me to have when I'm having fun? What's the most important thing that you want me to have? Benefit. Um, better uh, connections with people. Better connection with people. Perfect. And ask it, is that the highest intention or is there something higher? First thought. That... Is, is that the highest intention? Do you feel like that's the highest intention? Um, so so I, I feel like there's creativity and there's all of these other things that I kind of feel yeah. like come with freedom, like creativity and stuff, but yeah, um, but like fun and c connection and playfulness and like not everything having to be so serious all the time. Right. I love that, man. And so what I want you to do is notice the image now and tell me if the image changed. Notice the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what's the image look like now? It's like super still and there's like clouds breaking through as sunlight comes through and like all this stuff. Right. And so is that, hold on, is it, that real or am I just wanting it to be more positive this, or does no, that even matter? No, the subconscious mind works through metaphor. So it's exactly okay. real because when it was inside of you, it was tumultuous. When it got out of you, it was a yeah, little yeah. bit more still. And now that you're understanding this quote unquote part of you, because the word healing the, the etymology of it means wholeness, bringing these parts into the whole, into the higher version of yourself, right? And it's looking to be understood. So we, let's just do one quick thing for time's sake. Um, we can dive way deep. This is a really cool process. But the reason I'm doing this, and I'll explain for everybody listening what you can do for yourself, is I wanted him to look at this emotion and I wanted him to understand what does it really want beyond the safety, right? It wants connection. It wants to have fun. It wants to be playful. It wants to be creative, Right. Ultimately, that emotion doesn't just want you safe. It wants all of these things, but usually it, it acts in a way that because of safety, it hinders what it really wants. It hinders deep connection because it doesn't let people in. So I want you to notice the image now, Mark, and just tell me what happens when I say this, okay? I want that part of you to know that you can look for ways when you learn to invite the right people in that you could trust that people that you could have more fun with, you could build a better team. You could be have more fun because you're not so stressed out all the time. If you learn to allow yourself to begin to trust other people slowly, but surely, and ask this part of you, if it's willing to, if it's willing to allow you to begin to trust people and what take the next simple step in it and just notice that part and notice what happened to the image when I said that. What do you notice? I, I, I feel like it got darker. Okay. So, so was I want, it, was it supposed to or no? no it, it's, it, we just take everything as information. There's no right or wrong. Oh, so okay. I'm going to, I'm going to let that part of you know that the way that it's been acting has been keeping it from its highest intention of really having you find connection and have fun. And I know it's scared to go forward and let you move forward. And this is where you, Mark, need to let it know how old you are now. Let that part of you know how old you are now. I'm 40 now. Oh gosh. Say, I'm 40 now and I have new resources and, and, and man, I want to dive so deep and I know it, it's there, but for time's sake, let's just do this. Take a deep breath and allow yourself just to be still and watch it for a second. And I want you to ask this part of you, what is it that you truly need? What's the next simple step that you need to feel safe enough to start trusting people now? What's the next simple step? I need to give people the opportunity to succeed or fail. 
Yeah. And then, and what else? And take a deep breath and look at that part of you again. And just know that it's been doing everything it can to protect you, to keep you safe. And give it some gratitude for a moment. Instead of rejecting <laughs> it, give it gratitude for trying to keep you safe. It's gotten me this far, right? <laughs> right. It has. It's, it, there's been so many positive benefits that it's given you. It's taught you to work hard. It's taught you to build your podcast. It's taught you to be a leader. It's taught you all these things. But now it's reached this point where it's going to only take you so far. But in order for you to find the love, the joy, the happiness, the freedom, the creativity that you need, now it needs to learn something new. Now the 14-year-old version of you needs to step into the 40-year-old version of you. Mm. And so just take a deep breath. And I know it sounds really interesting, but what's the next simple step that you can take to give yourself more trust in this area? Well, we have, um, we have a team member who's launching, well, we are launching a new podcast. Um, and I've asked a team member to step up and lead it. And I would normally uh, micromanage a lot of it, but yeah. Um, I could let her show me what she's capable of. Yeah. And when you give that part of you gratitude for trying to keep you safe, what did you feel differently in your body? Instead of rejecting or really just seeking and understand it, when you gave that part of you first gratitude for trying to keep you safe and keep you connected, what did you feel in your body when you did that? When I was giving it gratitude, I, I felt yeah. really good. I was like, yeah, yeah. and now... I feel really nervous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I can do this. It's change. Change is uncomfortable. Yeah. And the interesting thing is taking the next simple step. And you guys, if you're listening, my main point in this is I, I took them to a process. You don't have to go through yourself. But what I typically do is we have to give that part of ourselves gratitude for trying to keep us safe, even though we're pissed off that it's quote unquote hurting us. Mm -hmm. Right. If you reject the part of you that's trying to keep you safe, then the second that Mark looked at it and said, Hey, what do you really want? Well, I want to protect you. What is every time I go into Henry when I'm like, why am I so scared of just unleashing every freaking part of me when I was trying to overcome my, you know, when I was overcoming all my passivity, it's like, Oh no, I, I want you to stay safe. I don't want you to dysregulate the people you love. You're going to be isolated. I'd be like, dude, that was little Henry. And you're, and, and I, and sometimes people will be dysregulated, but I had to, it's like a younger version of myself to say, Hey, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for trying to keep me safe. What can we do to start showing you that I'm today years old, that I have new resources, that that person may not get it completely right. However, guess what? You know, we're going to be able to have more fun. We're going to have more creativity and have way more success and impact that we really want when we're doing that. And it's weird, but you almost need to start leading like your spirit self has to begin to lead your body into understanding where you are now. Because whenever you get triggered, whenever you get reactive, your mind, you're, you don't know whether it's the past or now. Mm -hmm. All you're reacting in is if you were hurt again, or if you were struggling and or someone did you wrong again, whenever you start to trust somebody. But we have to teach our nervous system that it's safe to trust people for you because the world needs more of Mark. And the more people that can support Mark, the more people that Mark can build up into learning what Mark knows and teaching him as a leader, the more Mark's voice is going to get out into the world. The more Mark will have success monetarily, the more impact he's going to have, the better he's going to be for his family, the better he's going to be for himself. And so when you can now go inward and say, thank you for keeping me safe. And this is what's happening when we're stuck in this is where we really want to be. What are the next simple steps? What do I really need to teach myself that I'm safe to do this? It's a different approach than being like, just suck it up. Freaking a-hole. Just go do it. You know, let that person go do it. And you're still nervous wreck every time they're doing it. And you're going to try to micromanage it. Even if you don't versus like, what's the truth that they're going to mess up. And what's the truth that you're going to be fine. And what's the truth is they're going to learn. And what's the truth is you're going to build systems. And what's the truth is you're going to learn to be a, le a better leader. What's the truth? You're going to learn to, to build better infrastructure, you know? And when we start to peel off the layers of what the truth really is, and we, instead of getting caught up in the emotion, now we're sitting with the emotion. The reason I brought it outside of you is I want you to sit with it and say, what is really going on underneath the surface? My body's just trying to keep me safe, man. And it, I don't want to override this, but if I did, if you just sat there for a few minutes and be like, oh, that makes sense that I feel this way. 
because every time in my past, I've been screwed or every time in my past, I've been this. So what did I learn from that? What learnings can I have to move forward? Because the reality is no one's going to get it right. And if I don't really understand what I really need, then I'm going to be stuck in this for a really long time or I'm going to be walking against the wind. You are a legend. <laughs> Dude, no, you're awesome, man. I saw, I just dove into a process. I was like, let's just go. I, yeah, I, I, no, I was kind of like asking you to, you know, I was kind of asking you to go there. And, uh, you know, um, I have to sit with this now because I feel, um, I feel the optimism of like an answer. Yeah. And I feel the uncomfortableness and the tension of like, oh, this is uncomfortable, which I've trained myself to know, like to lean into that, right? Like yeah. this, like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Okay, yeah, let's go. But you are a total badass, man. Dude, Thank you so much. Same, brother. I'll end with this is sometimes discomfort and fear doesn't mean you're going in the wrong direction. It means you're going in the right direction because you're stepping into new territory and your nervous system's like, what are we doing? And then you just teach it that you're safe in this new place. And you, and you begin to embody it. And so this just means you're headed in the right direction. And I'm pumped for it, bro. So thanks for having me, man. I'm really grateful to be here. And, and uh, thanks for letting me be open. And I appreciate your openness and your heart, man. You have such a beautiful heart. Thank you. Where's the best place for people to connect with you if they wanted to learn all of the things about making it happen? <laughs> uh, Instagram is at Henry Amar, H-E-N-R-Y-A-M-A-R. My podcast, Making It Happen with Henry Amar. Um, you know, you could just find me on all the socials, you know, if you have any questions, shoot and it, me a message. And it was, it's a top seven podcast. So, I mean, you know, it's gold right there, right? Oh man. It's, it goes, you know, the one thing I learned about podcasts, be consistent, you know, like it goes in and out of the charts, but it, to me, it's like the most random times and most random places, but it's just like, I'm just grateful to serve, man. I'm really grateful. Thanks for doing what you do. I really am grateful for it. And, um, thanks for having me on, man. I'm, I'm really genuinely just glad to share. So I appreciate it. Well, until next time, because there will be another time. Yeah, brother. <laughs> Sounds good.